Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, and I uh, wanted to wish all the veterans out there a uh, happy Veterans Day weekend coming up. And if, uh, if you know any veterans, give them a big hug or kiss as appropriate. And uh, if you don't know any veterans, go out and find one. They're really neat people. So we have a, a show. We're starting a little bit early today. We have a, a show coming up that is uh, fraught with uh, just current events that uh, surprised us, you know, as we came on the air and I started to talk to my guest this afternoon. Um, we got Mike Stritsky, uh, who lives in New Jersey, but does a lot of work in California. So he's coming to us from California right now in the midst of all the wildfires that are going on. And uh, he's literally caught up in the middle of all of it. So he's, uh, he's actually calling in from a friend's house and um, we can't even get a Zoom connection with him because uh, he doesn't have his computer equipment. Uh, it was all part of the casualty of, uh, of the fires that are going on. So Mike, um, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it, especially with all the, the stress going on over there and uh, things that have been happening. But thanks for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome, Stan. Like I said, this cause is so important. Uh, even in the uh, face of disaster, the word still needs to get out. Yeah, and um, and you yeah. made a comment earlier that uh, you know this the the climate change piece is uh, important, and that just kind of drives home the importance of clean energy and and going carbon free as soon as we can. Yeah, I mean, as the weather patterns are changing right now. We're seeing, you know, severe storms and severe droughts. I'm noticing it back in New Jersey, and I notice it here in California. Over the last uh, 10 years, uh, you know, the seasons here in Southern California are drier than they've ever been. Uh, and New Jersey, they've wetter. We've had the wettest year uh, in history in New Jersey with all the rain. I didn't see the sunlight for more than a couple of weeks uh, in the Northeast. And it's the rains, normally we would get light rains. Now we're getting monsoons. In California right now, that's the biggest story. If anybody's been watching the news, um, here in Thousand Oaks and Malibu, we had uh, the shootings yesterday. And then to compound that, we had the fires last night that, uh, that burned uh, 14,000 acres, including uh, you know my home at the Calamigos Ranch. Um, never seen anything like this in my entire life. I mean, people are trapped on the... Pacific Coast Highway, not able to get out. It's, uh, the fire is being driven by 50 mile an hour winds with zero humidity in it, which means that these fires are very fast moving and they have a lot of fuel to burn on. Uh, you know, multi million dollar homes are all going up in smoke and there's not a firefighter in sight because the, this fire is so large. Wow. It's just absolutely incredible. The air quality is miserable out here. I can't see the sun from uh, all the smoke that's in the air. Uh, but it just goes to show you, you know, we're starting to see that the climate is changing. And, you know, the more and more carbon we put up into the air, the more the weather patterns are gonna change and wreak havoc, the storms are gonna get more powerful and natural disasters are gonna become greater. Um, hence, we need to, to start changing our ways. You know, to think that man couldn't do anything to the environment, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction and for the first time in history you know we have two of the largest populations in the world india and china you know helping us uh, throw a lot of carbon up there so we got to get off of fossil fuels we got to get into renewable sources and use the big nuclear ball in the sky that shines every day and you know the hydrogen economy it's the only thing that's going to be able to turn the ship around and send us the other way when you're only making pure oxygen uh, and water for your uh, for your energy, the planet will heal itself a lot quicker. Um, you know, I have to, to comment on California that they are very proactive in figuring out all of the problems with the hydrogen economies uh, by being the pioneers for this. Um, they've gone through a lot of growing pains with the hydrogen fuel cell technology, uh, not so much as the uh, the vehicles, but a lot with the infrastructure. Um, you know, right now they had, didn't build stations that were big enough and they had a, a lot of uh, uh, vehicles that, you know, they sold more vehicles than they had fueling stations. 
plus they had some, you know, uh, growing pains with the equipment on how to do it, how to distribute it, and, um, you know, but all of that is being figured out, you know, as we go, and Toyota's playing a huge role in this. Right now, you've got hydrogen refueling stations, five of them opening up in the Northeast, and the, some of them are already open, and you'll have some more in the next couple of weeks. So we're starting at both coasts, and we're working toward the middle. But the good news is, is it's happening. Everybody's starting to get online and knowing that batteries are not the solution. Um, you know, it's going to be like Betamax and VHS. You know, it's, it's, you're going to find out who's going to win out in the end. But, uh, you know, when you can fill the car in five minutes and uh, you get the same amount of juice out of it each and every charge for 25 years, uh, you know, it's really the cure for the disease rather than the treatment. Right. Um, but we're, we're working in the right direction, and it's just going to take everybody to start voting with their checkbooks to make this happen. You know, if you go out and you buy a Tesla today, you're spending 140000 You can go out and buy a Toyota Mirai with free fuel for three years right now for a $300 lease for, uh, for $56,000, either of which is still, uh, you know, they're giving you a, a, almost a free car when you count in the price of the fuel for three years. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're putting in some heavy incentives to make this happen, and they're getting a lot of feedback from the early adopters on part, part of the uh, you know, Toyo, Toyota Mirai's Facebook pages, so we get to hear what everybody's experiences are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and that's how you work out problems to get this technology implemented. But yeah. so far, you know, everybody's been the trailblazers, and, you know, we're making it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot in New Jersey. I bought a Toyota Mirai that I'm taking around to all the schools and government agencies in the Northeast. We've uh, logoed the car with uh, all the components as where they sit in the Toyota Mirai. So when we take them out to schools and organizations, they can see where all the parts and pieces are located. So we have the fuel cell, which is under the seat, the motor controller, uh, which is under the hood, and you have the... Uh, uh, the battery, which is up above the, uh, the rear seat headrest. So all of these things are, you know, we're, we're educating the public. Half the people don't know what fuel cell vehicles are and what they can do. So education is obviously the first, you know, place that we're going, and then, you know, implementation will be the second. Chances are in the next five years, you know, if the guys will be getting their licenses in the next five years, we'll be driving a fuel cell car or at least have the option to at all the dealerships. Um, next week, I'm going to be going to another conference uh, here in California that is concerned over making renewable hydrogen. So, uh, you know, if we can make it from solar and wind, we're on our way to really starting to change the, 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 the planet. Uh, right now, Texas is the energy capital of the world as far as um, renewable energy. Uh, let alone fossil fuel. They have uh, the best, one of the best sun exposures for solar. They have a huge amount of land mass, and they have the biggest amount of wind, uh, you know, of any other state in the nation. And all of that is going to waste right now because they're not harnessing it. They're shutting the windmills off. Wow. If they were making hydrogen with all that, putting it into the pipelines, you know, they could supply the whole entire United States off the existing infrastructure. So all the keys are there, all the solution is there, the will to do it is all we need. Well, we're paralleling you uh, here out in Hawaii. We're, we're doing the same, we've got the same kind of things going. We already have Mirais on island. I just got notified last week that I'm on the list for one of the first Mirais. So we're just waiting for that to all step into place. We've got a, a small consortium started to uh, head up some hydrogen infrastructure here. and. Um, so we're, we're right along with you and we're, we're uh, in step with what you're trying to do in New Jersey and in the Northeast. For those stations in the Northeast, are, are they um, doing electrolysis or are they steam reforming or are they similar to the stations in uh, California or, or what? So, uh, you know, Air Liquide is putting these in with Toyota. So right now the short stick and the, cost, the most cost effective right now is to do steam reformation. Since New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the nation, I mean, five stations will do the same as 30 stations in California, plus we're on the Northeast Corridor, which connects all the other states. So basically, the whole Northeast Corridor is the size of the state of California. So it won't take that many stations. 
in order to put the infrastructure in. In addition to that, since we're an oil refining state, hydrogen has been made there, you know, since the turn of the century. So, you know, they're used to making hydrogen uh, for commercial uses. And, you know, for fuel cell vehicles, it's a quick loop as almost all the refineries have a steam reformation process or a hydrogen process as part of the, the uh, refining of uh, oil, petroleum, natural gas, et cetera. So they just throw in some um, pressure yeah, swing absorption and clean it up then? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, steam reformation. So, uh, you know, what they're also doing here in California is they're building a very large um, digester system and syngas where they're actually making hydrogen from biomass. So they're taking all the waste in the garbage and they're going to do something like 2,000 kilograms a day um, hydrogen that's going to be refueling all the ports, uh, all the trucks in the ports. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of things going on in the fuel cell market where you have uh, Nikola, which is the truck manufacturer, uh, they just sold 800 uh, fuel cell trucks to Anheuser-Busch and many other companies, you know, pre predated sales, and they partnered with Nell in order to put the refueling infrastructure in. And they're promising all this by, you know, uh, 2023. So all of this is all in motion on large and small scales. Um, things like graphene are going to reduce the cost of the fuel cells along with non-noble metal catalysts like nickel and cobalt. All these things are coming as material sciences advance uh, and nanotechnology uh, starts to get integrated into the manufacturing processes. So. You know, unlike batteries that had trillions of dollars invested in it over the last 150 years, the, the fuel cells at the very beginning of the learning curve. So it's, you know, kind of compare it to like the uh, first cell phone that came out and the iPhone of today. They're, they look nothing alike. So there's a lot of room for improvement. And we're going to see it. You know, the big advantages of the fuel cells, obviously, is the energy density. And, you know, you're not paying a weight panel penalty. You're not carrying around two tons of batteries or if you're doing a semi-truck, six tons of batteries, and something that goes bad every uh, five years and ends up in the landfill because it's 100% non-recyclable. The fuel cell cars are 96% recyclable, and that's a huge advantage. They fill up in five minutes, and you're gonna get 25 you know, years of use, and you're not dragging around a two-ton battery. The only byproduct of the, these cars is basically water, every tank full of Hydrogen, you produce 12 gallons of drinking water, same as the space shuttle. So all the right reasons to do this are in place. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, going down the path of the electric vehicle, vehicles right now are, is basically giving oil another 10 years, and we, we don't have another 10 years. You know, I consider the electric vehicles a known failure because you can never put that much copper in the ground, and, you know, you're not going to build the electrical grid nine times bigger just to support, you know, one vehicle. Yeah, and so, most of the power is coming from an electric grid that runs off coal or, uh, or oil and things like that anyway. Right. So, you know, hydrogen is the cure for the disease. The, the electric vehicles right now, you know, are the treatment. You know, so we, we, there are certain diseases in life we have to cure, and energy is one of them. Yeah. And, you know, they, we have to cure in front of us, but we're making too much money on the treatment. It's just like the drug companies. If you had the cure for cancer, you know, you're a dead man. And if you uh, you, you have the uh, the treatment, you're golden. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll tell you what, Mike, we're, we're going we're gonna to take a quick break here and come back and talk more about uh, the actual, instead of treating the symptoms, going for the, the full cure in about uh, 60 seconds, all right? All right. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. 
the kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man on my lunch hour with Mike Stritsky calling in from California, his second home, uh, at least once he rebuilds a home that he just bought there. Um, apparently the, the wildfires are going crazy again uh, over in California. And uh, it's time that we get our, our hand, heads wrapped around how to fix that problem. So Mike, um, what are some of the things in California, I mean in, in New Jersey that you've been working on um, to bring us up to speed since we talked to you last time? Well, you know, the big things that are going on in California is now they're gearing to go to renewable energy for the hydrogen. Um, that's a big push because you got to pull the carbon out of the picture. Right. So, you know, um, things that are secondary, like, you know, making it out of biomass, which is carbon that would normally go into the atmosphere anyway, is preferable over virgin carbon where you, you know, pull it out of the ground and steam reform it from natural gas. So, you know, that's what a lot of the environmentalists are arguing about. And, you know, they're, they're right, but, you know, you have to be able to get the machine built, um, you know, with the te technology that's most cost effective because, you know, new technologies are expensive until they get mass production in there and enough people behind it. So we're at the point right now where it's going to take everything. You know, I tell all my colleagues that, that work for different companies that, you know, there are no competitors right now unless we start to make money. If, if you know, we all don't win, then nobody wins. Right. So, you know, everybody, that's why you're seeing Toyota and Honda and Mercedes and everybody working together to get this out there to take the automobile out of the environmental equation. Um, and we, we're at the point that we can actually do that. I've been driving this Toyota Mirai. Uh, you know, I drove it to Vegas and back. Uh, there weren't enough refueling stations, so, uh, you know, uh, I brought my own hydrogen with me uh, to fill it. We're using the same hydrogen infrastructure right now that they're using to do the forklifts. You know, my personal feeling is, is if everything goes down to 5,000 pounds rather than 10,000 pounds, you're going to get this all technology out there a lot quicker because, you know, it's going to be at a pressure that's much more manageable for the uh, – you know, the technical general mm -hmm. gas distribution population that they're used to working with. How open, is Toyota, with how open is Toyota for that? Because I know that um, Chris McWinney was trying to convince Toyota that, you know, his system could do 5,000 PSI um, and, and do a half fill for a car, but Toyota was kind of resisting that a little bit. Are they open now? I don't know if they're open now, but I think that this tech, this is going to happen with or without whatever Toyota feels because um, obviously because of the cost difference and because they're putting in infrastructure for these uh, forklifts, I mean, really all you have to do is add one more tank. You know, as far as hydrogen goes, whenever you double the pressure, you double the storage. So, yeah, obviously they want to get as much in there as possible and they want to keep you know, the uh, refueling infrastructure as a specialty company. And I'm not in total agreement with, you know, yeah. uh, letting them have a monopoly on that. Okay. So, but like by going to 5,000 pounds, it opens it up to a lot more players and it opens it up to home refueling at that point as well. Right. So I'm building a home refueling station at my house right now that we're gonna be able to do four Mirais and they're gonna, it's gonna be a portable station off my jewel box technology. So, you know, I'm filling all my, all my, my Toyota Mirai with solar hydrogen from the Hydrogen House Project. And, you know, that makes a difference. I have the only hydrogen refueling station, you know, in New Jersey right now, you know, to fill these vehicles. And I probably have the only one in the country that's doing it off of solar hydrogen. You so, know, with the exception of Stone Edge Farms. Stone Edge Farms does have a solar hydrogen refueling station using Chris's equipment. Okay, so how much how much solar do you have on your house in New Jersey and how much uh, battery storage and how, and how much hydrogen storage at what pressure to give us an idea of 
what a home setup would be like. Okay. So yeah, that, my, I have 27 kilowatts at the house. Um, you know, which I back feed quite a bit. I have uh, I have three or four hydrogen vehicles of various vintages. So I have a hydrogen fuel cell lawnmower. I have a hydrogen fuel cell Polaris Ranger. I have a hydrogen fuel cell boat, and I have two hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, um, all of which I power off of, uh, you know, my 27 kilowatts worth of solar. Um, I have one proton electrolyzer that generates 2.2 kilograms a day. I have 120 days in storage. Uh, I store about 125 kilograms in my system um, at any one time. The house runs on an energy cycle, so during the uh, spring, I use my 27 kilowatts to fill my 12,000-gallon um, propane tanks with low-pressure hydrogen. Um, by the end of June, I'm finished. I backfeed with my solar back to the grid, uh, 25 of the 27 kilowatts, uh, till the end of September. And then I'm neutral for the... Um, for the fall, and then I siphon off some of the hydrogen for at night for my geothermal heat pump that heats the house during the winter time, and then the cycle starts all over again. The uh, battery storage I have is a, is a one and a half days worth of storage, and there's 120 days in hydrogen. Okay. So basically, for all the short round trip storage, we use the batteries, which is what batteries does best. Right. They do short, high current storage. The fuel cell doesn't kick on until it hits 20% uh, depth of discharge on the battery, so we get very long lives out of the stupid lead-acid batteries, which is what I have in the house, and I've had there since 2004, uh, the exact same battery pack. So if you treat things right, you know, everything works perfect, and it's been 13 years now. Uh, my house has been off the grid, and we've done others as well. Um, 2015, we... Uh, when public, we're the only hydrogen fuel cell uh, company in the world, integrator company in the world that uh, does integration. And we've done, you know, celebrity homes uh, and just regular residences for people using our jewel box technology. So all of this is happening in real time. Um, you know, so we're, we're looking for people that are going to vote with their checkbook, people who can afford to do it, people who want to be energy independent, people who care about the planet. And, you know, we need them to purchase this equipment and make a statement. Um, the ones we've sold so far, these are people that are want to lead by example and, you know, lead by doing something, not talking about doing something. Right. You can have the best ideas in the world, and they're dead brain cells unless you act on them. Well, let's... So this whole life is about what you do, not what you talk about doing or fail to do. Right. So let's spend... A, we got about a minute or so left. Let's spend the last minute talking about Stone Age Farms and, uh, and Craig Wooster's uh, work there. Uh, you know, he passed away a, a few weeks ago and maybe kind of highlighting his contributions to that end. Yeah, Craig, Craig was basically another mate. We, we, we basically walked along the same lines. I've known Craig for three and a half years, and I took a trip with him when we drove the, our Toyota Mirage down to Vegas and back last year for SPI. Your viewers want to check it out. It's uh, front page on my website. But Craig was a doer. Um, you know, he put together the Stone Edge uh, microgrid project. They had four Toyota Mirais. They had a uh, you know a 25 kilogram storage and uh, 12 kilogram electrolyzer driving uh, their hydrogen storage end of it. They had saltwater batteries. They had a capstone micro turbine. They were experimenting with everything. He operated his uh, nonprofit the same way I operated mine. We made sure that all the projects that we worked on and completed, uh, we taught the student interns so that we passed this technology on. You know, whatever gas that's left in my, my tank and in Craig's tank, he devoted to passing the technology and paying it forward. Uh, he was a great pioneer. He was a very unselfish person. He was very smart, and he was very devoted to, to the cause of bringing renewable energy to the next generation and to leave something behind and teach his kids and grandkids, you know, uh, the right thing to do in life. You know, he taught people, he, he showed people how to live. He didn't tell them how to live. And he was lucky enough to have, uh, you know, uh, Mac Load over at the Stone Edge Farms 
funding the whole thing, which was absolutely great. I was up at the memorial service and said a few words, and you know he was he was very much loved, and he'll be very much missed. Yeah, well, I, I'm really proud to have had the chance to meet him, and uh, I know we're all going to miss him, and we appreciate his contributions uh, towards the effort that all of us are, are really pushing. Um, and is Stone Edge uh, pretty much safe from uh, the current fires that are going on? Um, I haven't really checked. I know there's been fires in Northern California. I knew they had one of the farms burnt down last year. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, when you live in Southern Cal or, or Northern California, you're always subject to fires. Uh, it's one of the things you live with. It's like living in a hurricane zone. Yeah. So what, uh, what's your next steps there in California for your hydrogen house? I know you're kind of at a setback right now. What are your, what are your plans for well, pulling together some funds? We're going to open up, going to be opening up a hydrogen house in Malibu on the Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, we've already secured the building, um, and we're in the process right now of building all of the duplicate equipment I have at my hydrogen house to, to move out there. We've already been in contact with uh, Pepperdine to get student interns um, involved in uh, helping me run the nonprofit out here and building uh, some of the equipment that we'll be doing demonstrations, uh, you know, in California. So I'm going to kind of pick up some of the slack that, uh, you know, Craig left behind to keep the, uh, the legacy moving forward. Uh, so that's been a big focus. Um, you know, like I said, back at my home in New Jersey, we're doing student outreach programs. We're working with the public service gas and electric internship program. So we'd like to get 27 interns involved in, um, you know, this type of technology. So we're we're teaching them how to fish, not how to eat fish. Um, so I'm continuing those programs. So it's going to be education, outreach, uh, demonstration projects on both coasts. So we're going to start at either end and work to the middle. Well, and we're incorporating new technology as we go, as it becomes available. Well, so we're great. looking for as many people as we can to you know, to sponsor the effort. So if any of your listeners are so inclined, they can go to the Hydrogen House Project, uh, make a donation, or get involved in some of the stuff we're doing. Terrific, Mike. And we appreciate the, the work you're doing, the work being done at Stone Edge Farms. And uh, we'll keep tracking you and, and talk to you in a few more months and get caught up on how things are going out there on the West Coast as well as we recover from this. But thanks for your time today. I, I appreciate it, especially with everything going on out there that you could spend some time with us today. And, um, you know, we'll be, you'll be in our prayers with all the folks in California on these wildfires. And uh, you're right, we need to be focusing on hydrogen and coming up with a real solution here quick. We need to cure the disease, not treat it forever. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Mike. And uh, we're going to sign off for now and see everybody next week on Stan Energy Man. And um, aloha till then.